Okay, here's OCRA 2017 paper two for A-level physics. Starting off with multiple choice, question one. The diagram below shows the motion of positive and negative particles in a conducting solution. Which statement is correct? The current in the solution is zero. No, because we do have an overall flow of charge, so that's wrong. B, the conventional current is to the left. Now, conventional current is in the opposite direction to the flow of electrons. So if you have electrons flowing to the right, then that means that conventional current is flowing to the left. So that is correct. So the answer is going to be B. Let's just check the other two. The positive particles are always protons. Negative particles are always electrons. Well, they're probably not going to be in this case. It's going to be ions. Number two, one million electrons travel between two points in a circuit. The total energy gained by the electrons is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. What is the potential difference between the two points? Well, potential difference is energy divided by charge. So that's going to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10 divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That's the charge of one electron times that by a million. So that's 10 to the six. And because the 1.6s cancel out, that gives us 10 to the minus 10 divided by 10 to the minus 13. And so the answer is 1000. That's one times 10 to the three. The answer is C. Question three, which is not an unit of energy kilowatt hours. Well, that is because we have power times time electron volt we know that that's energy as well joules yes watts well we know that's energy per second so it's d four a circuit is shown below the battery has negligible internal resistance the temperature of the ntc thermistor is decreased okay so we know that if the temperature goes down that means that the resistance of it goes up which of the following statements is are correct the current in x increases Let's have a think. If the resistance of this is going up, then that means that overall the resistance has increased. So that is incorrect. The current at Y remains the same. Well, if the resistance of this is changing, it doesn't affect the resistance of these two resistors here. Because they're in parallel with the thermistor, the resistance is only going to change the current flowing through this branch here. So the current is going to be the same at y. Finally, three, the potential difference across the thermistor increases. Yes, we said that at the beginning, so that's true. So it's only two and three. Five, a progressive wave of amplitude A has intensity I. The wave combines with another wave of amplitude 0.6A at a point in space. The phase difference between the waves is 180 degrees. What is the resultant intensity of the combined waves in terms of I? So what is the resultant amplitude going to be, first of all? Well, we have A meeting minus 0.6A, as it were, because they're out of phase with each other. So altogether, we're going to have 0.4A. However, intensity is proportional to A squared. So that means that it's 0.4 squared. That gives us 0.16. The answer is A. Six, stationary waves are produced in a tube closed at one end and open at the other end. The fundamental frequency is 120 hertz. What is a possible frequency of a harmonic for this tube? Okay, so it's closed at one end and open on the other. That means that our fundamental frequency is this wave here. That's what it looks like. So if we double the frequency, we're going to get an antinode of this end. So it can't be that. So it has to be an odd number. It can't be 60. We know that it's not going to be 240. 360 is an odd multiple of 120, so that has to be it. Seven, the graph below shows the variation of PDV with charge Q for a capacitor. Which row is correct for the gradient of the graph and the area under the graph? Well, we know that capacitance is charge stored per volt. And so if we have a graph of V against Q, we have the flip version of this. So it's not going to be capacitance, it's going to be capacitance to the minus one. And the area under the graph is going to be half QV. And you should know that that's work done. So it's A. Six, a capacitor discharges through a resistor. At time zero, the charge stored by the capacitor is 600 microcoulombs. The capacitor loses 5% of its charge every second. What is the charge left on the capacitor at time t equals four seconds? Well, there's a nice easy way of doing this because we can just say that every second we have 0.95, 95% of the charge left. So in order to find what it is after four seconds, all we need to do is 0.95 to the power of four. That gives us 0.81. All we have to do then is times it by 600, 
which is the original amount, and we end up with 489 microcoulombs. So it is D, or P it appears, anyway. Nine, two isolated parallel capacitor plates of an equal and opposite charge. Separation between the plates is doubled, but the charge on each plate remains the same, but the PD between the plates doubles, which statement is correct. Well, what is changing? We have D is going up, and we also have V is going up, so they're both doubling. So, A, the capacitance of the capacitor doubles. We know that the capacitance is actually proportional to one over D, so therefore that's not correct. B, the energy stored by the capacitor is halved. Energy is half CV squared. So if C is going down by two because of the distance, but V is going up by a factor of two, that's not gonna be half either. C, the permittivity of free space doubles. No, that never changes. D, the electric field strength between the plates remains the same. Well, electric field strength is for parallel plates V over D. So if both of these double, it stays the same. The answer is D. 10, which statement is correct? A. Hadrons are made up of protons and neutrons. Nope, they're made up of quarks. Positron and proton are an example of leptons. Positron is, proton isn't. Positron and electron have the same mass? Yes, they do. Weak nuclear force is responsible for alpha decay. Now that's strong. Yeah, of course it's C. 11. An electron moves in a circle of radius 2 centimeters in a uniform magnetic field of flux density 170 milliteslas. What is the momentum of this electron? So, the force BQV equals mv squared over r. One of the V's cancel, we're looking for momentum. So MV is going to be equals to BQR. So that's gonna be 0.17, that's our flux density, times the charge of an electron, times the radius in meters. And that gives us 5.4 times 10 to the minus 22. 12, a proton collides with a stationary oxygen 18 nucleus. The collision produces a fluorine 18 nucleus in particle X. What is particle X? Well, we just need to make sure that we have the numbers right for starters. We have one and 18 go into 18, and so this must be one. One and eight goes to nine, and well, that's gotta be zero. So what has a mass of one, but a charge of zero? It's a neutron. 13, a beam of charged particles is not deflected when it passes through a region where both electric and magnetic fields are correct. Which statement is not correct? All the particles have the same speed. Well, we know that V equals E over B. So the speed is determined by the electric field strength and the flux density. So we know that they all do have the same speed. So that's not the answer we're looking for. The resultant force on each particle is zero. That's correct as well, because they're going in a straight line. C, the magnetic force is equal to the electric force in each particle, same thing as B. D, the magnetic field and the electric field are in the same direction. Well, of course we know that's not true because magnetic field has to act at right angles to velocity in order to have an effect, it's D. 14, there are four important attenuation mechanisms by which X-ray photons may interact when they pass through matter. In which mechanism is the X-ray photon scattered with a longer wavelength? Even if you don't know the answer to this one, you can use process of elim of elimination, simple scattering, well that doesn't change the wavelength of x-rays, does it? Pair production, that's not actually a scattering mechanism at all. Photoelectric effect, well again, that's not scattering as well, really. It's the Compton effect, that's what happens when an x-ray collides with a particle and then bounces off, but it has its wavelength increased. 15, a ray of monochromatic light is incident at the boundary between two transparent materials, yana yana. Critical angle is equal to 80 degrees. What is the ratio N1 over N2? Now, they've been really cheeky with this question. I've just messed it up because usually when we talk about refractive indices, N1 is the refractive index of the material that the light is in to begin with, but they've swapped them around here. So let's go with this instead. N2, that's this, sine 80. And then if it's going along the boundary like this, that equals N1 sine 90. Sine 90 is 1. Just take this over here and we end up with this ratio equals to sine 80. That is just 0 0.98. It's B. 16a. State the principle of superposition of waves. When two waves meet, the resultant displacement is equal to the sum of their individual displacements. Figure 16.1 shows an arrangement to demonstrate the interference of monochromatic light. So we have a double slit, we have 
a slit separation of 0.25 millimeters. We have our big distance there, so that's big D, and we have our slit separation here. Slit separation is S, that's 2.5 times 10 to the minus four meters. Coherent blue light from a laser is incident. Yada, yada, yada. Figure 16.2 shows the dark and bright fringes observed on the screen. The pattern shown in figure 16.2 is drawn to scale. <gasps> Looks like we're gonna have to get our rulers out. Use figure 16.2 to determine accurately the wavelength of the blue light from the laser. So we know that we're not just going to measure one of these bad boys, we're going to measure, well, it's probably gonna be 10. So let's have a look. If we call this one zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, it's just gonna be nine then. I can see that at least on my printed out copy here, nine fringes is equal to 6.9 centimeters. So that's zero, so that's 69 millimeters. Therefore, one fringe width is going to be a ninth of this. So that's seven point seven times 10 to the minus three meters, 7.7 .7 millimeters. And we know that according to Young's double slit equation, lambda equals WS over D, so 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus three times 2.5 times 10 to the minus four, divided by the big distance, 4.25, that gives us a wavelength of 4.5 times 10 to the minus seven meters. And for visible light, we are looking for times 10 to the minus seven meters, so that makes sense. Part two, the blue light is now replaced by a similar beam of red light. Stay and explain the effect, if any, on the fringes observed on the screen. Well, we know the fringe width, rearranging this, is lambda D over S, so therefore, Fringe width is proportional to lambda. Red light has longer wavelength, therefore fringe width increases. 17, state one SI base quantity other than length, mass, and time. Current is the other one. You might argue that you can have temperature as well, but we know that we can get speed of particles from temperature too. So I would go with current just to be safe. Figure 17 shows two resistors, X and Y connected in series. The resistors are wires. Both wires are the same length L and diameter D. Material of X has resistivity rho, material of Y has a resistivity two rho. So the total resistance R of the wires is given by the equation R equals this. Okay, so first of all, we know that resistance is equal to rho L over A. So the resistance of resistor X is that, but R Y, is two rho L over A. Adding these up together, we get the total resistance. So that's three rho L over A, but we know that A is pi D squared over four. But if we're dividing by this, the four can come on top here. So that means that we have 12 rho L over pi d squared, easy peasy. Part three, student uses the equation in one to determine R. The table below shows the recorded data by the student in her lab book. Name the likely instruments used by the student to measure L and D. Length of the wire, we're talking about centimeters here, so we're probably talking a ruler. And for D, we're probably talking about a micrometer. Not going to be a vernier caliper because they aren't as precise as a micrometer. Use a data and table and the equation to determine R and the absolute uncertainty. Write your answer to the correct number of significant figures. Okay, so we have that our resistance altogether is 12 rho L over pi D squared. So let's get our value first, shall we? So it's gonna be 12 times 4.7 times 10 to the minus seven times the length. So that's in centimeters though, so let's be careful, 0.095 divided by pi times, and this is millimeters again, so that's gonna be 2.7 times 10 to the minus four squared. And we have a resistance of this showing up on the calculator. However, our least precise readings here go to two significant figures. That means that we cannot give an answer that is to more than two significant figures. So we just have to write down 2.3. Let's write down our full answer anyway, because that might come in handy when we 
calculate our uncertainty in a sec. So we are dividing numbers here, so we have to find out our percentage uncertainties. So there is no percentage uncertainty in row, so that's okay. What is the percentage uncertainty in L? It's going to be 0.1 divided by 9.5 times 100 to change the percentage, 1.05%. What about D? we have 1.1%, 1.11. So in order to find out the overall percentage uncertainty of this, we need to take our percentage uncertainty in L, so that's 1.05% plus the uncertainty in D, but double it because it's D squared, so that's 2.22%. So that gives us 3.27%. So let's turn that back into an absolute uncertainty using our values so of 2.3395. Let's go with our full value times 0.0327. We could use our percentage button on a calculator if you want to. And that gives us 0.07, but of course we can only go to one decimal place. So that's just 0 0.1 ohms. Three, the instrument used to measure D has a zero error. The measured D is much larger than the actual value. Discuss how the actual value of R compares with the value calculated above. So if D is smaller, we know that area, cross-sectional area is smaller. And because ultimately R equals rho L over A, therefore R is bigger. 18, figure 18.1 shows a circuit. Cell has an EMF, 1.5 volts. Cell and the variable power supply both have negligible internal resistance. The EMF of the power supply is set to 4.2 volts. Calculate the current in the 33 ohm resistor. So we're basically just being asked to find out the total current. So first things first, let's find out the total EMF. We have this cell trying to push this way, this power supply trying to push this way. So it's gonna be 4.2, take away 1.5, and that gives us 2.7 volts. And in order to find out the current, we need to have the total EMF divided by the total resistance. This is just V equals IR, just for total EMF, total resistance. So it's gonna be 2.7 divided by the R total. The question is, what is this? So one over R of this, is equal to one over 120 plus one over 60. So that gives us three over 120. Therefore, R flipping this on its head is 120 over three, that equals 40 ohms. So if this all together is 40 ohms, this is 33, the overall resistance is 73 ohms. So we end up with a current of 0 0.037 amps. Part two, the EMF of the variable power supply is now slowly decreased from 4.2 to zero volts. Describe the effect on the current I in the 33 ohm resistor. So current will decrease until zero when EMF of supply is equal to 1.5 volts. If we have 1.5, 1.5, no overall EMF. But it will then increase in opposite direction below this. B, a group of students are investigating the power dissipated in a variable resistor connected across the terminals of a cell. Cell has an EMF 1.5 volts. Student determined the power P dissipated in a variable resistor of resistance R. Okay, so we have that. Let's see what the question is asking us. Group of students know that maximum power is dissipated in the resistor when R is equal to the internal resistance R of the cell. Describe with the help of a suitable circuit diagram how the students may have determined P and R. Use figure 18.2 to estimate the internal resistance R of the cell and discuss any limitations of the data plotted by the graph. So if we have our cell here, and let's model the internal resistance as a little resistor in there. Let's draw a dotted box around the outside. We need to measure the current. We have our variable resistor there. And of course, we want to measure the terminal PD. So voltmeter there is fine. You should, of course, use a pencil and a ruler. I'm just lazy. So P is obtained by V times I. R is obtained by V over I. Resistance of variable resistor is gradually 
increased from 0 0.5 ohms to 7 ohms. According to the graph here, V and I being recorded. So what we can do is find a general sort of curve of what's going on here. Now I would say that it looks like the maximum power is happening at 4.5 watts. P max equals 4.4 watts. And that happens at a resistance of roughly, let's say 2.4 ohms. Therefore, R is roughly 2.4 ohms. The internal resistance is that. Limitations of the data. It's really dumb because just when they needed points around here, they didn't actually take any results. No results around peak power. Therefore, interpreted curve of best fit, unreliable. More data required. E.g. at 2 ohms. Because you seem to be missing a point from here, which would have been kind of helpful. So there we go. 19. EM radiation is incident on a negatively charged zinc plate. Electrons are emitted from the surface of the plate when a weak intensity ultraviolet source is used. Electrons are not emitted at all when an intense visible light from a lamp is used. Explain these observations. Photoelectric effect describes how electrons interact with one photon and vice versa. Therefore, energy of photon must have sufficient energy to liberate an electron from the metal. As E equals HF, frequency of photons must be above threshold in order to overcome the work function. Intensity only increases number of photons. B, the maximum wavelength of the EM radi radiation incident on the surface of the metal is 2.9 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Calculate the maximum kinetic energy of electrons emitted from the surface of the metal when each incident photon has an energy of 5.1 electron volts. Okay, so we know that EK max, that's the maximum kinetic energy that an electron can have after it's been liberated, is equal to HF, that's the energy of the photon going in. Take away the work function, that's the energy needed to get it liberated to begin with. We have been given the maximum wavelength, and so we can find out the threshold frequency from that. That gives us the work function. This is equals to HF0, where F0 is the threshold frequency. But seeing that we're dealing with wavelength, we're going to go with HC over lambda instead. HF, we're not actually given the frequency, we're given the actual energy of the photons. So let's just actually pop that into our calculator then. Oh, great, the camera decided to give up the ghost without even letting me know. So just finishing this off, EK max, 5.1 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That's our energy of the photons. Take away the work function, so that's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by the wavelength, which is this. So that's just HF phi, this is HC over lambda. That gives us 1.3 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, just under one electron volt. C, EM radiation, constant wavelength, incident on a plate, photoelectrons, yada yada. Negative plates on the electrode are both in a vacuum, electrode is connected to a negative terminal. Okay, so the graph shows a variation of current as the PD across the plates is increased from zero to three volts. Explain why the current decreases as V increases and describe how you can determine the max Ke of the emitted electrons. So when I equals zero, work done on electrons by electric field in plates is equal to Ke they should have. So we can say that EV equals EK and that is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 times, uh, and I think that happens at 2.2 volts. That gives us 3.5 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That's the max Ke that they would have. When PD equals zero volts, electrons have Ek to move from one plate to the other Therefore, current flows in circuit. 
Question 20, figure 20.1 shows a positively charged metal sphere with a negatively charged metal plate. On the figure, draw a minimum of five electric field lines to show the field pattern between the sphere and the plate. So we know that because we're coming from a point here, effectively going to a plate, we know that they're going to curve around like that. Question is, which way are they going? Well, we know that field lines show the direction of a force on a positive charge, so they're gonna go away from the sphere and towards the negatively charged plate. B, define electric potential at a point in space. This is one definition that you need to know back to front, and that is the work done, or the energy, we're gonna go with work done, per unit charge, or we could say per coulomb, to move a positive charge, it has to be positive, doesn't work for negative, from infinity to that point. Textbook definition. C, metal sphere is given a positive charge by connecting its surface briefly to the positive terminal of a power supply. Negative potential at the surface of the sphere is five kilovolts. Sphere has a radius 1.5 centimeters. So the charge Q on the surface is that. Okay, so we have a potential and we have a distance. We can call that R. So let's just remind ourselves what is potential. Well, it's one over four pi epsilon zero times the charge divided by the distance. We're trying to find the charge here. So that gives us four pi epsilon zero VR. So that's four pi times 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 times our PD of 5,000 times our distance 0 0.015. Putting that all in, we get a charge of 8.34 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Part 2. Figure shows the charged sphere suspended from a nylon thread and placed between two oppositely charged vertical plates. Weight of the sphere is that, and so that's acting downwards there. String makes an angle of 4 degrees with the vertical, show that the electric force is that. So we have our weight, but ultimately we're looking for the sideways force there. So if we make a triangle, we have a weight there, we have our overall force here, and therefore we have our sideways force there. We're looking for this. If that's four degrees there, this side is our adjacent, that's our weight, so this is our opposite here. So we're looking for tan theta. So tan of four equals F over the weight Therefore, F equal to tan 4 times 1.7 times 10 to the minus 2. And lo and behold, that does give us 1.19 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. But to calculate the uniform electric field strength E between the parallel plates, well, we know for parallel plates, electric field strength is equals to V over D. And we don't have either of these, though, do we? We don't have the PD across the plates and we don't have the distance, so we can't use that. But we know that any electric field strength, we know that any electric field strength is equal to the force divided by the charge. So we just need to take our 1.19 times 10 to the minus 3, divide it by our charge, which you said is 8.34 times 10 to the minus 9. So let's just tidy this up a little bit. I can just put this to 1.19 times 10 to the 6 divided by 8.34, that gives us 1.4 times 10 to the five newtons per coulomb. 21, a capacitor of capacitance 7.2 picofarads consists of two parallel plates, yada yada. Okay, so we have the capacitance. They're separated by an insulator of that, so that's 1.2 times 10 to the minus three meters, that's our D. The area of overlap between the plates is that, that just means you know, the, the actual area of the plate, so that's our A. Calculate the permittivity of the insulator between the capacitor plate. So we're looking for the relative permittivity. So our capacitance is equal to the permittivity between the plates times the area divided by the distance. We're looking for the permittivity. So it's gonna be C, D over A. So 7.2 times 10 to the minus 12 times 1.2 times 10 to the minus three divided by four times 10 to the minus four days. And that gives us a permittivity of 2.16 times 10 to the minus 11. Or oh, let's go to two sig figs, seeing that all the data was to two sig figs. Figure 21 shows a circuit. Capacitance of each capacitor is 1000 microfarads. The resistance of the resistor is 10 kilo ohms. The cell has an EMF 1.5 and negligible internal resistance. Calculate the total capacitance C in the circuit. 
So you might remember that if you want the R total of resistors in series, you just add them up. But actually, it's the opposite for capacitors. If you add them in series, so C equivalent, it's 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. But if they're the same, then you probably know that it's just going to half. So overall, the capacitance of this is 500 microfarads. This is still 1000 microfarads. And then all we have to do is add them up. Overall, all together, we have a capacitance of 1,500 microfarads. Switch S is closed at time T0. There is zero potential difference across the capacitance of T0. Calculate the PD V across the resistor at time 12 seconds. Okay, so V over V0 is equal to E to the minus T over RC. Where RC is a time constant, that's just resistance times the capacitance. So that is equal to E to the minus 12 over, resistance is 10 kilo ohms, it's 10,000 times 1,000 or 1 1.5 times 10 to the minus three. Ultimately, this ends up being E to the minus 12 over 15. So the voltage is going to be this times the original EMF. And that gives us 0 0.67 volts. Now let's just have a think. What have we actually found the PD across? Now if the capacitor was discharging, this would be the PD left across the capacitor. And so we'd have 1.5 minus that on the resistor. But because we're actually charging the capacitors in this case, it's the other way around. So this is actually the answer. Because what we have is this decay going on because we are talking about the PD in the resistor, not across the capacitors. 22, a student conducts an experiment to confirm that the uniform flux density between pulse and magnet is 30 milliteslas. Current carrying wire of five centimeters, perpendicular to the field, yada, yada, okay. Student's analysis is shown in the space below. Evaluate the information in figure 22.1 and the analysis of the data from the experiment. No further calculations are necessary. Now, what can we say first of all about the line of best fit going on here? Well, it's not very clear because camera isn't picking it up too well, but basically we have this anomalous result here and the line of best fit actually misses it. So we can actually go with one of two things. We can say line of best fit misses one point bar or it is anomalous. They've also used this triangle here to find the gradient. But when we find a gradient, we need to use a triangle that spans at least half of the points. So triangle used to calculate gradient is too small. So we could also say that we do have error bars for the force. We don't have error bars for the current. I'm gonna leave that one for now though. What else do we have? Well, we have current there, then there, then there. So we don't have equally spaced out results. So readings were not taken at consistent intervals. So let's check their analysis here. We have the gradient equals BL. So that's F over I, that is correct. So they've done 3.8, take away three, that's correct. Times 10 to the minus three, divided by 2.5, that's correct. So this seems pretty good and uh, that's 32 milliteslas. So we can say that result is indeed close to value given. However, they actually haven't done anything with the error bars in so far that they haven't found a percentage uncertainty in the gradient. So no uncertainty in gradient given, no lines of worst fit, and no uncertainty given in B either. So a few points there should get you six marks. B, figure 22.2 shows a transformer circuit. Primary coil is connected to an alternating voltage supply. A filament lamp is connected to the output of the secondary coil. Use Faraday's law of EM induction to explain why the filament lamp is lit. Nice and easy. AC in primary coil produces fluctuating magnetic field in the iron core. Flux cuts coils in secondary flux cuts the wire in the secondary coil and as emf equals rate of change of flux emf is induced and therefore that's going to be ac in the secondary coil as well current flows through bulb part two primary coil has 400 turns secondary coil has 20 turns 
potential difference across the lamp is 12 volts and it dissipates 24 watts. Transformer is 100% efficient. Okay, so we know the power is the same in both. Calculate the current in the primary coil. If you know the voltage and the power in the secondary coil, then we can find out the current in the secondary coil. So we know P equals IV, so this is gonna be P of V. So that's 24 by 12, so that is two amps. Now, we know that the voltage is proportional to the number of turns. However, because it is 100% efficient, and we're talking about currents, we can say that current is proportional, current is inversely proportional to the number of turns. So we can say that I1, N1 equals I2, N2. We're looking for I1, so let's pop this under here. So that gives us two times 20 divided by 400. So that's 40 by 400. That gives us 0 0.1 amps. Two, the alternating voltage supply is replaced by a battery in an open switch in series. Switch is closed, the lamp is lit for a short period of time and then remains off. Explain this observation. So when switch is closed, current increases briefly, then constant. Therefore, flux only changes during this instant, during this instance, but does not change after. So no EMF induced. Question 23, describe the nature of the strong nuclear force. So the strong nuclear force, it acts between quarks. Range is three to four femtometers. And it's attractive above 0 0.5 femtometers and repulsive below. Name a hadron found in the nucleus of an atom and state its quark combination. Name of hadron, well, we could go with the nud or the pude. Let's go with a nud, neutron, and it's nud up, down, down. Write a decay equation in terms of a quark model for beta minus decay. So we know that when beta minus occurs, we have a neutron turning into a proton and it gives it an electron at the same time. So we're going from up, down, down to up, up, down. So the only thing that's changing is a down quark's turning into an up quark. So down, it goes to up quark plus beta minus, plus beta minus, plus an anti-electron neutrino. It's up to you whether you put a beta or an E, both are acceptable. Radius of a nucleus is directly proportional to A to the third, where A is a nuclear number at the mass of the proton, and a neutron is similar. Explain why the mean density of all nuclei is about the same. So we can say that the mass of a nucleus is proportional to a volume of a nucleus is proportional to R cubed. Therefore, volume is proportional to A2, because if R is proportional to A to the third, that means that we have A to the third, the third times by three, we end up with just A to the one. Therefore, density proportional to A over A, roughly constant. 24, stars produce energy by nuclear fusion. One particular fusion reaction between two protons is shown below. In this reaction, 2.2 mega electron volts of energy is released. Only one of the particles shown in the reaction has binding energy. Determine the binding energy per nucleon of this particle. Explain your answer. So what is the only particle that has binding energy here? It's this deuterium that is made of two particles. So H2 has two particles. Therefore, if we had no energy here, but actually now we have this energy given out, 2.2 mega electron volts, that means that the binding energy is 1.1 mega electron volts each. Explain why high temperatures are necessary for fusion reactions to occur in stars. Nuclei repel due to electrostatic force. Therefore, high energy is and speeds needed to overcome this and move nuclei to within range of strong nuclear force. See a gamma photon in a star can spontaneously create an electron positron pair. Calculate the maximum wavelength of a gamma photon for this creation event. So if we're looking to make an electron and a positron, we need energy equals two mc squared, where m is the mass of one of these bad boys. And this is equal to the energy of the photon, that's HF, but because we're looking for wavelength, we're gonna go with instead HC over lambda. We're looking for lambda, so let's just swap these two around. Lambda equals HC over two mc squared. One of the c's cancels, 
we end up with 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 divided by 2 times the mass of an electron times the speed of light. Let's do the bottom bit first, and that gives us 1.2 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. Last page, 25, fluorine 18 is a common radioactive isotope used in PET. Using PET scanners, fluorine 18 emits positrons. The patient is injected with a radio pharmaceutical containing fluorine 18. Describe how PET scanner is used to locate an area of increased activity within the patient. So we have a patient is surrounded by gamma detectors. Positrons annihilate electrons in area of increased activity. Gamma photons produced, and that is two photons traveling in opposite directions. And then the last bit is arrival time. The arrival times are used to calculate point of origin. B, the half-life of fluorine 18 is 110 minutes. Calculate the time T in minutes for the activity for the pharmaceutical to decrease to 30% of its original activity. So we know that a half-life is given by log two over lambda, where lambda is the decay constant. So let's find out lambda first, swap these two rounds. So we have log two over the half-life. So that's log two over 110. That gives us 6.3 times 10 to the minus three. Uh, yeah, that's gonna be minutes to the minus one, but we don't care about that too much. So therefore, we're looking for 30%. So that means A over A zero, that's the activity equals 0 0.3, and that is equal to E to the minus lambda T. So we're looking for T, so we're gonna take logs of both sides, log, and that's ln, I can say log, that's fine, equals minus lambda T, so therefore the time is going to be log 0.3, or we can say minus log 0.3 over the decay constant, and that gives us 191 minutes. Finally, C, PET scanners are not available in all hospitals. This is because fluorine 18 requires expensive on-site particle accelerators, and fluorine 18 has a very small shelf life. Suggest the impact this may have on the treatment and diagnosis of the patients in the country. Let's just go for longer waiting lists. Boom, job's good. If you want to go on to paper three, click the card. And if you found this helpful, don't forget to leave a like. And I'll see you next time.